Okay. Well, I'm glad that so many people are here. There are lots of spaces here also in the front, so you just can sit down here in the front. Um, yeah, just as a reminder, uh, this talk is streamed and recorded, so if there are any questions, please wait until you have the microphone or ask them in the Slack channel. The Slack channel for this room is Kohle Bunker 2, um, just so the question reach us. Um, and now it's my very great pleasure to welcome Tamash. Uh, he's a postdoctoral researcher at the LMU and the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics. And, um, well, he's using machine learning to help to widen our understanding of dark energy and the universe in itself, and I'm very looking forward to your talk. Welcome. Thanks, thanks so much. Ah, yes, fantastic. Ah, fantastic. So, I'm here to talk about astrophysics, cosmology, but also about AI, and as the title implies, I'm still too polite to call it generative AI, because for me this is statistical learning, and I was trying to move along the PR direction. But it's in principle basically about how we use synthetic data and data generative methods to, to power our instrumentation, our machine learning operations, in the end to, to somehow peek beyond what surrounds us here down in Earth. And my talk will have three rough uh, sections. First, I will give a brief, a brief intro into, into astrophysics and cosmology, then give a concrete example about uh, how we actually use uh, generative methods in a concrete example, and then show some of their applications down here in Earth. And so, sometimes this needs no introduction, but actually I think here maybe it does. Is, so, why do we actually care about astrophysics and cosmology? And if we set all the curiosity aside and look at this very utilitarian picture, astrophysics and cosmology is in this data renaissance. The amount of information we are gathering, the amount of data we collect through telescopes and satellites is tremendous. And our old methods simply are not suitable to process it. So we, have to, we had to move to the forefront of data science and machine learning to, to actually make sense of it. So don't think about gigabytes, think about petabytes, sometimes even petabytes per second, compressed into one or two numbers. One or two numbers which you can write at the end of a physics textbook. And in my personal research, the type of stuff I deal with is data which is actually not representative of anything we have seen before, really, outli really hard outliers, anomalies, pathological data sets, and and, and in general, very hard to access data. So sometimes hard to access means that you have to ask your boss. For us, it means working for 10 years and launching a satellite to outer space. <laughs> and that puts a price tag on if you can be a bit better in something, you can be actually for us that matters a lot. And the key thing is that all the methods we see out there work here as well, down on Earth, because actually TNG is the prime example being mostly composed of physicists, is that sometimes it's even the same people who develop the astrophysics who later do the machine learning solutions for some companies. So it's not just that it's the same science, it's sometimes even done by the same people. I see some former colleagues, I think, in the audience. So the birth of astrophysics occurred roughly 200 years ago here in Munich. And of course, astronomy is one of the oldest professions, but what distinguishes astrophysics from astronomy is that through astrophysics, we can actually understand something out there which is, has real implications down here. So Fraunhofer uh, was an optician living in Munich, and he built the first spectrograph. And he looked into the spectra of the sun, and he discovered these dark lines. This can be super boring, except for the first time he's seen the element helium, which was discovered from astrophysics. And of course, if you have, like, Think about the implications of discovering something surrounding us from space. This is what the true meaning of astrophysics is, that we understand something right here from out there. Actually, this is the old observatory, the old Royal Observatory of Bavaria, where actually my office is. And of course, 200 years hasn't been too kind on the architecture. The people somehow got a bit more chill. But our methods have changed as well. And Instead of just simply looking for elements, chemical elements or, 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 or atoms in outer space, now we are mapping uh, the universe to search for dark matter and dark energy. And the main 
puzzle of our current era is this. Most of the universe is made of stuff we have no idea about. So dark energy is about 70% of what makes up everything. Of course, we don't see it here. And dark matter is about also 25%. And then you count all the atoms, all the dust, all the gas, all the stars. It's about 1%. So what turns out, we, just by living on Earth, we have a very sparse idea of what our world actually is. And if somebody would tell you 96% of the universe we have no idea about, you might think there's a lot of opportunity there, a lot of, lot of interesting things. Think about, think back to the past, think about electricity, nuclear power. Like a few hundred years ago, this seemed like fairy tales. I read a quote in the Motor World saying from Kaiser Wilhelm that I think I don't see any potential in the internal combustion engine. <laughs> I think it's just a fad. And new technologies and unknowns always have this potential. And that's why we are working so hard to understand it. So it's hard to give a talk today without reflecting on some of our key missions and key achievements. And I personally work at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics, which is distinguished from the Institute for Astrophysics by the fact that we use space instruments also and also build them. And this is actually a recent satellite, the Euclid satellite, which is tasked with mapping out uh, the sky, mapping out the universe. And it was partly built by our group, by Frank Group and Rob Bender. They were key players in making this happen. And of course, this is just a nice photo. It's the size of a uh, minivan. It's a state-of-the-art instrumentation. But here's the point, and I have to realize this is an afternoon talk, and you guys are probably very sleepy. So I actually want to want to sh wake you up a bit by uh, maybe Two minutes, 15 seconds just to count. sharing last Saturday. Two minutes, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Vehicle is pitching down range. So, this is, uh, you know, like the hard to access data. Like, it's not walking down the corridor, it's uh, negotiating a rocket launch. It's uh, one and a half billion euros blasting off into L2, outer space. It's still not there. It launched last Saturday and it's still not there, although we had the first sign of. Uh, instruments turning on. So that's, that's a big, big plus. It's a way off our shoulder. And the mission really is to, ooh, 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 is to get to the next slide. Turns out that's harder than launching a rocket. Ah, fantastic. Oh. OK, so this is really the mission, is that what you see here is a map, like the map of the Earth, but it's a map of the sky. And this bright band you see wiggling through is the Milky Way. And our mission, actually most of our mission, not in just this, this instrument, but actually in everywhere else uh, in the cosmological domain, is to map out the distribution of matter in the sky. What we see are galaxies. We are using optical telescopes. To, to take photographs, just like you would take a selfie. But of course, we take selfie of the sky without us in it. And, uh, and so this doesn't really sound too exciting. And it's kind of hard to grasp. What, what, what do we really see there? Isn't it just like dark? And so I want to illustrate what are we really after. So if you go hiking, sometimes you find an image like this. This is actually not far from Munich in the Bavarian Alps. It's actually an observatory belonging to uh, the LMU. And when you look around, you see the horizon covered by clouds. So there's nothing. You don't see the city. Munich is somewhere in the distance, nearby villages somewhere in the distance, and valleys, rivers, but it's all invisible. What we see is some of these mountain peaks sticking through the clouds. But you know, of course, we know that there are villages. We know, that we know what's under the cloud. And the reason we know it is because that's where we live. That's where we are. So, so it's, a, it's like an unfair advantage. If you would tell somebody to ask, tell me what's behind the 
the cloud curtain, they would have a very hard problem, and you would just say, ah, of course, you don't, you know. But it's actually very similar to our situation when we are mapping out the cosmos. So what we see are these speckles of light, galaxies composed of billions and billions of stars. And in a similar manner, they are actually, the region between them is actually not empty. These are just the peaks which we see. Actually, they are quite literally the densest parts of, uh, of where matter is in the universe. But we only see these speckles, and we have to connect the dots and make out where the valleys are and how deep they are and how much matter is in them. So if you look at the sky, and of course, this is a real picture from a space telescope, from the Hubble Space Telescope, but using our techniques in physics to simulate the universe, we are actually able to not provide you the real view, but provide you with a simulated view, what you would see if you would not, be, not just see optical light or light, but if you would see dark matter as well. And it turns out all that empty region and darkness is actually filled with these filaments and clumps of, of matter connecting in these threads. It's called the cosmic web. And most of the mass, most of the, actually, uh, most of the matter is in the form of this dark matter. And it's completely hidden away from us. And when you look at this picture, you start to see patterns. And those are the patterns we are also analyzing uh, in, in to understand where dark matter is and how much dark matter is there. So of course, uh, we cannot see dark matter. So it's kind of a hard problem, and it's not actually obvious what we can do with it. We can, come, we can think about these peaks, but what I'm personally, well, what I'm personally working on is uh, an effect called gravitational lensing. So if you, I'm not sure how well you can see this image, by the way, but what you should see is some of these funky looking galaxies. It's almost like somebody just took a chalk and started to draw these circles on this image. Maybe from the back row, it's not so visible. But that actually is, is a perception and impression. It's, it's, uh, it's almost like looking through a beer glass, a beer mass. What, when you look through some distorted source, the distorted, uh, distorting lens, you could see the background distorted. And when you measure these distortions of light, they actually tell you, tell you a lot about what happens uh, in front of that. So just to put it more clearly, so this image is actually produced by, a, by an effect called gravitational lensing. So when you can see a ma very massive object somewhere in front of you, a clump of dark matter, a clump of, a clump of galaxies, a clump of ma stuff, even if the stuff which you're looking at is completely invisible, its gravity still leaves an imprint. You can maybe catch this cartoon version, which distorts circular or elliptical blobs of light into these, into these stretched out features. So we use these objects. They are actually quite, um, sorry, quite uh, figuratively called galaxy clusters. They are the most massive structures which will ever exist in the universe. And that's a very bold statement to say ever exist. How can we say that? And that brings us to the other component in this equation, dark energy, because it was discovered 20 years ago that it actually drives an accelerating expansion in the universe. And that means that no, no more new massive objects can really form bigger than these galaxy clusters. So it's, in a sense, when we understand the universe, we study dark matter and dark energy, it teaches about where the universe will go. It also teaches us where it came from and what it's made of. All right. So of course, I've been showing you very idealized images. And this is where the second part of my talk comes from. So if you ever look at a nice background image in a MacBook, you see this beautiful galaxy. You can see it right there. Those are not the galaxies we are dealing with. It suddenly turns out into a really nice 64 by 64 grid of pixels, which is a beautiful signal processing problem when you think about it. And that's 
That's where we start to have a great need for statistics, for machine learning, and for very precisely calibrated instruments. So from a, from a statistical point of view, that our task is to, is to is basically to produce measurements of really rare objects. And part of the difficulty with that is we actually don't have too much data. And the data is usually very, very difficult to get. And normally, oh my god. <laughs> OK, well, normally, when, you, when your laser pointer doesn't explode in your hands, then uh, what you can do is, uh, OK, so normally, what you can do with <laughs> what you can do with most measurements in the real world is go to a lab and measure and certify what's happening. With astrophysics, this is not possible because we only see because we only see them on the sky and we cannot go there to test it. So we have to put in a great deal of effort into actually certifying and validating what's happening. So this brings us to one of the first roadblocks we've encountered in this journey. And this, this is where the problems begin. Because of course, when I say roadblock, it's not a roadblock. It's a year of someone's life or more. In this case, it's 10 years. When I first started to read about this, I was told that measuring distances in the cosmological setting, like how far a galaxy is, has been solved in the 90s. Little did I know that I will spend the next 10 years of my professional life figuring that out. And it's, easy, it's, it's an easy misunderstanding, because people think that now with our new methods, we have the good methods. We have neural networks. We have AI. We have expert systems, which have been created by hand over decades. So we, can, we are done. But turns out this was never an algorithm problem. This was always a training, a data problem. So what this really means is that there are genuine ambiguities in the universe. And the way you deal with a genuine ambiguity is by getting some information which helps you properly calibrate just simply accept the amount of ambiguity. So in this context, you can imagine two galaxies that completely different, two objects at completely different distances look complete, appear completely the same to you. It's like a big truck far away looks like a small car close up. Or uh, the standard example is a bright lamp very far away looks just like a small lamp close up if you're squinting and not having the proper resolution for it. Of course, I said calibrating distances. And in what we are basically doing, we suddenly realize that there's a difference between calibrating methods and validating methods. And what we realize is basically is that if you are actually able to certify a method, your calibration basically allows that to take information from somewhere and apply it to fix something else. So you have a way of measuring something in a lab, and you're using that information to, to fix something which wasn't working properly. In the case of validation, it's a bit uh, lighter form of information transfer, because in, the, in calibration, you are requiring whatever you're doing to be fully applicable, fully representative. And in the case of validation, I'm just, I can just say that I admit that what I'm doing has some limitations because I don't know full the full reality. And I'm using it to showcase that the methods, the tools we have make sense internally within a setting which I can control. And I'm actually using that to simply say that I'm not transferring information from somewhere. I'm simply saying that I accept the method to be working. And in our context, this will become very apparent why this is so important in a second. because. Basically, in physics, we have, a, we have an ability to simulate numerically aspects of the universe. So basically, from first principle, over decades, people figured out how to form universe, a universe, galaxies. And turns out that there are many ways of forming a very convincing universe, which is, doesn't actually correspond to our reality. It's a bit like using ChatGPT. It can form you perfectly sensible looking legal contracts. Of course, they make no sense when you compare it with reality. 
And this is also what we faced. So in a sense, we were forced to certify to the best of our knowledge, or actually test to the best of our knowledge that whatever methods we are using make sense, but we didn't have the full trustworthy source. We had only a limited, a substantial but limited amount of trust in what we are doing. So what we ended up doing is designing methods which can self-calibrate, and we were not transferring the actual calibration from simulation or from a test scenario to the real data, but we were basically testing the ability to self-calibrate in a setting, and then that convincing us to, that we can use some method in the real data. And of course, this is the old joke of building an algorithm is the first 90% of the work, and validating it is the second 90%. Or in other sense, it takes an afternoon to run something, and it takes two years to validate. And just to drive home this part about how well, what role does it really play to, to work with simulated, artificially created data sets in cosmology, of course, we cannot go there to actually look at it, whatever we're studying. So we are forced in this situation where we have to do something, but we have to work in a regime where we know that whatever we are doing will never truly correspond to reality in its fullness. So what you see in this image, hopefully, is a somewhat readable graph. There's actually exactly one thing you should see in this image, is that our simulations do not really agree with what we measure. They are on the same ballpark. I mean, this is a logarithmic vertical axis. So we, tr we clearly understand something. We are clearly close, but we cannot directly just pick it up and apply. This was actually another few years of uh, my career. So I mentioned simulations and, uh, in the context of physics and cosmology already. And there's a subtle distinction between if you're simulating a data, like simulating something from an intrinsic, by understanding its intrinsic working, such as a physical process, uh, a car, an engine, something, or if we simply create synthetic data about it. And I actually want to illustrate what this means, because I know it's a hard concept to, 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 to condense quickly. So we work a lot with astrophysical observations. And sometimes we find ourselves in, in a setting where it's very expensive to get the data. And simulating it is also very expensive, because we have to use all these supercomputers to to crunch the numbers for months and for graduate students to work on it for years. And in the era of machine learning, it occurred to us maybe we can actually use some form of AI or some form of statistical method to not simulate the data truly. It, it's all inner workings figured out, but just simply try to get to the result in some statistical process. So I'm going to go with an analogy. Please bear with me. So instead of astrophysics, I would like to use the language of art. So imagine some real expensive masterpiece, one of a kind, which, I mean, I don't have, but maybe you don't have either. So imagine this nice painting. And I want to have it. I want to look at it right now. And of course, I can't. So maybe we can arrange, we can, maybe we can arrange something. Maybe we can ask some actors to reenact it for us. You know, they, or, the, or the clothes, the background, the posture. Of course, it has the benefit that it's actually more than what the painting is. You can actually go walk around it. They, it's real life. You can, you can really understand how something like this would actually work. But of course, just imagine how expensive it is. I mean, I don't know anybody who I can ask for this. So, so I'm, what would you even do? But simply to go quick and dirty, you can build a statistical mock painting, which is not so realistic. It's, it's not really, like, it doesn't have any of the depth. I mean, with the actor, you know, like, you can, you can really understand the light. Just imagine, like, a, like, when you really want to paint something or understand something. This has none of it. But it captures some key points about 
it captures some key points. It, captures, it actually captures the posture even better, because it doesn't have to be a real person. You know, some of these paintings, some of these art projects actually have a person in an anatomically impossible posture or, or limb ratios. With machine learning, you can capture that. With a real actor, you cannot. Of course, this was the distinction between simulated data and synthetic data. So simulated in a sense means a deep physical simulation, versus synthetic means something we create using AI, using machine learning, using statistics. So I, I talked about getting data, how difficult it is. And of course, it's not just a sentence. It's, it's real life in every moment. So you live in a process of constantly waiting for the next thing to turn online, for the next source to come, and you spend yourself in preparation. And actually, actually, a lot of the times, the work we are actually doing consists of building these tools. I mean, this is a telescope in high altitude in a uh, very rare atmosphere, so you need special uh, workers in oxygen suits to build it, and I'm not one of them. But what I'm working on is powering the machine learning operations part of it to make sure that whatever we build in terms of statistical tools and methods will perform according to our requirements, that they will actually allow us to, get the, to make the type of physical measurements we, we want to make. Because, of course, we are building these instruments for a reason. Sometimes it's a very noble reason of understanding the universe, but that there's still a huge white paper specifying all the requirements and all the needs which, was, which we have to fulfill. And so when we, actually, ah, yes, when we actually have to do this, then we again hit this roadblock of, so of course I don't know, uh, nobody, nobody, yeah, nobody else really knows, if you, build a, build, if you turn on the most powerful telescope ever built, what will it see? Of course it will see new things. So you cannot truly prove that it will be uh, perfectly suited to observe what we have never observed before. But that doesn't mean from an engineering point of view that you don't have to do your best today to certify that you're building everything according to specifications and according to your own science desires. And that's actually the project I'm working in, in the last, for the last few years. So this was originally a uh, coming out of my PhD times uh, done at LMU and Max Planck. So we were building a generative data model for galaxy cluster observations. There's a more <laughs> interesting angle to this, because the way science works today is through these giant consortiums in the field of astrophysics. And we were not part of this. This is an American consortium. So they asked to, if you want to join, please give us something which we don't have, which is a very, sometimes it's a very hard bar to jump. But luckily, we were able to we, we were actually able to find a niche for us through these generative methods to, to fill into it. So it was, it's currently led by my, uh, my PI, uh, the principal Stella Sites at LMU and Max Planck, and I'm personally responsible for the technical uh, leadership of, uh, of this project. So basically our angle is to create a generative data model which can kind of forecast or provide a preview for what we will see in a specific measurement scenario. And so the way this is beneficial is, of course, it helps us to build the, the data processing pipelines, helps us to certify the machine learning pipelines. And there's a human element where the people who will be working on these, on these analysis, on these tools, will have to be also prepared. They also have to figure out their own organization, so they need data to start these processes. So it, it takes actually years to properly get into the headspace of working with a new type of data, figuring out how a new method will work. And so we cannot just start working on that when this is finished. This photo is a bit old, so it's already closing first, like the so-called first light, I think, in the next year, next years or so. so. But having synthetic data beforehand of course, an, ins an instrument this big also has access to a large number of simulations, physical simulations. But as I illustrated before, synthetic data has a unique niche where it can provide uh, statistically valid previews of data sets 
in situations where simulation is actually not really possible and not really feasible. So what this really means is to build a synthetic astronomy uh, software, which can create astronomical observations of a particular object, in this case, galaxy clusters, because that's our, our, our goal. And, and the interesting part is that we actually had to build it in a generative way. Because as I will illustrate in a few moments, so, so basically, real measurements are really expensive. We are, it's possible to, I mean, what you're seeing right now, the expensive real measurement is, is from a precursor survey, so from a previous existing data source. And of course, it's possible to mimic what you would see by spending a lot of money for somebody to, to measure it for you once or twice or a few times. But what you want is a cheap method to create some, which, something which looks almost like that in a generative way, where you can just simply create more of it. And I think this is the key point. One of the key points from the presentation is I work in astrophysics. These are images. But the actual way our approach works is in the form of a database, so a data table. So what we are really doing is we are creating a prescription for what these images should contain, where and in what relation, what properties to each other. You could call it metadata, for us this is just data. But so every single thing I will show from now on will exist in the level of databases and database operations. And so this brings us our first roadblock, is that in order to really calibrate, really reach our purpose, we need to be able to generate more data than what we had as training. Because otherwise, you cannot, can never fight statistical noise. And luckily, there are methods where in statistics, like kernel density estimates and, and, and uh, similar methods, which allow you to basically estimate our generator distribution for, for uh, actual observations. So in this case, what we were doing is transforming all the information uh, available about galaxy clusters into a generative, a generative model, which basically was trained in an unsupervised way to, to produce the data set with maximum probability, which we used which we are working with. This is basically step one. So you can imagine it the same way where a language model always predicts the next world. This model tries to predict the data it was trained on. And of course, these are data, fra data frames, databases. So they don't exist in one or two dimensions. They have dozens of features. And so this is, of course, a high dimensional uh, distribution estimation. And the way we construct these images is by using this prescription, this database we generate, and simply create galaxy images and, plug, and, and paste them together to produce a view of the sky. Now, this <laughs> brings up another ro other roadblock. Another year, in this case, the, from the life of uh, David Woofer in the audience. Where, so, you know. Deep learning has all these nice PR images of producing faces, cats, and dogs. So we also thought maybe we can use, we can make use of this technology to basically generate galaxies in a conditional way. So different features. Unfortunately, we have to conditionalize. We have to produce a conditional image generator in 10 plus dimensions. And it turns out that's actually surprisingly hard to do. And there's one more, <laughs> one more roadblock is that, you know, an image, it you know, goes from 0 to 1, 0 to 255, maybe some color channels. Galaxies don't work like that. Nobody in nature tells us what the characteristic scaling of a galaxy should be. I mean, we have some ideas, but it's not obvious that we are not missing something. So actually, there's an incredibly high fidelity requirement with very fine features, which you're basically making a statement on when you're standardizing your data. So after a year, in a rather, uh, rather anticlimactic way, we concluded with David that expert systems, which have been coded by hand for the last 30 years, simply perform in a more efficient way in production than deep learning. So you know, like, you live to learn. But also, these times, the human mind has overcome AI. 
So of course, this entire setting is embedded in this frame of certifying an instrument, so validating an instrument. And, and for, to achieve that, we have to insert a test signal into these images. You can see it in this bottom panel. It's widely exaggerated, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see it. It's a few percent, this few percent signal instead of what you see here. And our end result will be to, will be to try to recover it. I'll be sure that to you in a few slides, but I want to hit another roadblock before we get there, which is we actually do not really have enough data to train this. Because as I mentioned, these are really rare objects. We, you know, so these are really rare objects. The instrument we are going to use will be different from what we had before. And when we really want to certify something or, or span all possible scenarios, we have to actually span scenarios you never want to hit in real data. So you have to cover something which you normally would never want to observe. And basically, the solution we were driven, having no other choice, is to create a form of composite data generator model, which can uh, combine different sources, different fragments of information about the sensor, uh, about the targets we are aiming for, and overall information about galaxies and astrophysics, all in the form of databases, which can integrate them together into a consistent model which can generate, generate data. So the sketch, basically, the way you can imagine it is we are able to combine two different databases or data sets on the level of this generative modeling. It's, it's a, a high-dimensional Bayesian estimator for the generative distribution. Apologies for, for swearing. Uh, which can, for example, pick a specific scenario which we have very limited information about and use something like a template or past information to combine them and fill in the gaps. And actually, this allows us to, you can see a wild mock-up of, of this uh, for illustration. Basically, it allows us to, to combine together databases which do not actually have shared entries, but they have shared columns. So in a statistical way, we can model them together. And we can bring different fragments of information so that it, we are able to produce something which inherits from both and behaves as the target we were aiming to, tar we were aiming to reproduce. And um, so of course, once I describe something like this, you could say, of course, sure. How do we know this is valid? And of course, that was also another few years of, of actual research. And basically, there's two ways to know. One way is that you're not the only person who works in a, works in a science field. So you have colleagues with completely independent data sets, with completely independent decades of expertise. And you can send them one of these synthetic scenarios and ask them, OK, so is this real? Is, which, is, which is real? You can show them two data sets or two images. And the moment they uh, stop being to tell them apart is when you start to sleep well at night. And there's another way, which is you can use simulations, like physics simulations, which of course are not exact reality, but they still allow us to, to go into and do these deep dive tests. Like, would this statistical feature this column in this database, which we're trying to, to inject and to, 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 to synthesize, was that successful in excruciating detail? And in the end, doing these procedures actually brings us to the, to the ability to, to, to recover the test signal which we actually injected. This is, of course, work in progress. So so it's more interesting for my colleagues in the actual commissioning and, uh, and project accepting side, because at some point, somebody has to sign off on uh, an instrument working. So that's the basic angle. So when we are using these generative data models, of course, synthetic, we can create synthetic data, which is, of course, not what will be, but it's our best guess today. 
some of, from some of these very complicated situations. And the main angle is to, to prepare ourselves, to make the case. There are some difficult decisions we have, to make along, we have to make along the way about which method to use, how much to invest into certain calibrations and certain procedures. And this allows us to be ready to go when the real date arrives, so once the telescope is actually finished. So this, of course, helps us answer questions about dark matter and dark energy. What is our fate in the universe? Where did we come from? But I'm sure in every conference there are people who think, OK, so what's this in for me? Why should I care? And this goes back to the old picture of when we explore the universe, we are hitting problems which are actually the same problems we have down on Earth. So in the context of this talk, this is like we hitting data science, machine learning problems, which are the same problems which we have down in Earth. So astrophysics is not unique in not having enough data about something. Like every new thing we do doesn't actually have the we do it before we actually have the data available because we would only have the data if we would have done it. And so there's this loop which we have in building these instruments, in working with this. Is to justify a project, I need to showcase it with the data, which I would only have if I would have done the project. I've actually talked with some colleagues, uh, former colleagues, who described to me very similar situations. In order for us to risk doing something you know, in, in, in an industrial setting, we have to first showcase it would be worth doing, but we can only show it would be worth doing if we actually use the data we were not sure about using. And what synthetic data does is it can break this circle, cycle. So instead of getting stuck in this loop, we can untangle it. So we can start developing with synthetic data. And actually, one of the benefits of the work we have been, embarked, we have been doing is that it allows a highly automated way of dealing with these problems. So to create synthetic data, in an automated way, in a version-controlled way, where you are actually able to be explicit about your assumptions. So it's, of course, it's very easy to ask somebody with 40 years of experience to please do me something, like, like mock, up, mock, mock up something for me. But then you have no idea what went into their, into their decision or into their designs. And for us, it was ex extremely important to be very specific about what data sources we used, what assumptions we made on the, level of, uh, on the level of those data sources, and to be repeatable. So basically, in one of my last slides, I just want to, to highlight that these methods are also useful for rebalancing data sets. Basically, we use it to prototype inaccessible data and to reuse data more than what we had, so basically to pseudonymize it. And I haven't really touched upon it too much, but a large section of statistics in cosmology is spent on measuring disagreement between data sets. And the language of probability distributions of these generating models actually is very natural to measure outliers and anomalies. So basically, this brings us to the fact earlier this day, there was a talk here highlighting the importance of research, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And that's the note I want to end in, because actually we have seen that there is some possibility to transform this into a product for wider use. And that's actually what we are working on. So if you're interested about anything we have mentioned or I have mentioned, then please, let's grab a, be grab a beer. So thanks very much. And, uh, and sorry for the laser pointer. I didn't mean to have it explode in my hands. I, I'm not used to presenting with that. No worries. I think exactly nothing happened. OK. Uh, so we have plenty of time for questions. So if there are any, just give me a show of hands. And then I will come run to you. There are the questions. Uh, can you tell a little bit more about uh, the software that uh, you were using um, 
did you use uh, off the shelf software, open source? Uh, did you, uh, so like, for example, the database you, you were talking about? Oh, precisely. So we have been, in, 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 we of course had to be compatible with the data, uh, like in the software, we, which is in this collaboration because we have to hand it off to them. So this is Python and, uh, and Pandas. And so the, in Python in particular, scikit-learn, but the, the hard computation was written by us in just regular code. So it's statistical operations which run on a local supercomputing cluster. It's, uh, so it's made in-house in, in, in Python. I, I, I think it's very interesting, these transfer kind of yeah. conceptual topics, and yeah. this one. Um, I, I just want to mention an intuition that I have. I don't know whether you have, you have talked about that um, this expert systems kind of approach uh, uh, outperformed the deep learning approach. It, it reminds me, the story reminds me of this uh, evolution of generative image production, where probably you have gone into it, but this, this um, revolution over the past, I think, four years when this diffusion models were transferred from physics to generative image production and suddenly with the training data available, they were suddenly able to produce the, the image generation and that with much less training data and somehow this, what you described as using the column as template, and, and, and somehow this sounds, I'm not very familiar with the exact methods, but somehow in principle it, it has some relation, I think. And Absolutely. I mean, with the expert systems you have the explainability, which you don't get with it the other way, but, but as you would also. Uh, yeah. Precisely, and with the expert systems you also have much more granular high fidelity control. Because if you ever really try to play around with some of these methods which produce images, like, like once you have one or two like, classes in requirement, it produces products well. But once you have like 20, not classes, but like numerical values which you have to fulfill, it suddenly becomes very difficult to control and actually very consuming. But your idea is actually right. Actually, this is, this is actually a Bayesian prior update from 200 years ago, mathematics textbooks, just uh, with a applied to databases. <laughs> so, so your intuition is, is right, because there's, of course, statistics has these very deep uh, uh, like backgrounds in it. It's just, of course, applying this in a tractable way into a, like a database and representing it, that there's a lot of know-how going into it and how to do it. But you're completely right. It's, it's, it, it, it doesn't really come out of the blue completely. It just has a, an interesting application, which I hope is, which I'm actually here to promote. <laughs> Any other question? Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the statistical model you used? Sure. Uh, did you just use a joint distribution and, um, I don't know, did someone transfer on that? Or did you use some graphical models? Or what do you mean, graphical? Uh, like uh, modeling different nodes in, the, in a probabilistic network? No, it's actually very, so the surprising thing was how well the simplest model actually worked. So basically, in order to make this happen, of course, each of these sections, like in the top two panels, there's this basically a, a density representation of uh, a data set. And then there's a resampling technique, which evaluates some criterion to, to evaluate the distribution which can produce this. So it's, uh, it's not, I, we haven't, I haven't used the method you're, you're mentioning. It, it's actually a very simple, simple approach, which seemed to work. And, once something very simple works, it, it actually is a very good thing. There's many other ways to do this, like estimate these uh, distribution functions or generative models to like, more complicated ways, but we didn't have to go there for this, this project. OK, so if there are another question, great. Building on the previous question, could you explain a little bit more about the exact uh, specifications of the simplest model? Ah, yes. So this is the distribution, which, so it's 
It's, an, it's a Bayesian estimator for the distribution which produces the provided like template or scenario uh, subsections of the feature space the consistent way. So, so that's a specification which, for which you can actually write down a criterion and evaluate that through some numerical optimization, like, like numerical techniques. So, so the, the statement, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, is it? Uh, is it uh, like a Gaussian mixture model, or what is the? Uh, kind, kind of. It's it's okay. it's not a Gaussian mixture. It's uh, the way we represent these distributions is a bit more streamlined for for this. But I, I mean, you're representing a functional surface in d dimensions, actually in the uh, n and n dimensions in two two sections, uh, two, two twice, and and then using basically the encompassing space. You're basically creating an estimator for the distribution in the encompassing space. Okay. And, and, and then you evaluate on it, like an estimate on that numerically. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. If there are no more questions, then once again, thanks a lot for the great talk, Tamás. <laughs>